behind you. Your destiny, your promise, your future. You might as well shout before you get it. Because God sent me here to tell you that what he has for you is going to be big. That it's my season. That it's my season. You ought to declare that over your own life. Say, I believe. I believe. That it's my time. That it's my time. It's my time. It's my time. And I can feel it. And I can feel it. <laughs> Say, breakthroughs in the room. Breakthroughs in the room. It's yours if you want it. Anticipate it. God's getting ready to move. God's getting ready to move. Listen, you ought to declare this over your own life. Say it. God, he's working a miracle just for me. And it's going to be. Hey, listen, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about my future. Why? It's going to be big. Shouting into my promise. Why? God's gonna. Amen. Amen. Come on. Praise the Lord right where you are. Hallelujah. Listen, you don't need for me to give you a reason to praise the Lord. We have entered a brand new year. God has given us 365 more days to try to get it right. But most importantly, he has given us 365 more days of life. So even as you reflect on 2023 and all that it was, good or bad, you should be thankful for the fact that you made it through and that he protected you and allowed you to see a brand new year. That alone should propel you to give him all the praise within your heart and spirit and soul right now. Hallelujah. And with that, we say greetings. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our first service of 2024 here on our Tuesday night online church services, where we give all glory to God for what he is doing continuously even in the new year, through this, his Global Church Body Alliance. And as we normally do, we want to begin by extending hellos and salutations and welcomes to our beautiful, beloved, majestic sister church in Garland, Texas, Oasis on the Mount, Church and Healing Center, led by my brother, Pastor Chris Pipkin. Greetings, Oasis. Happy New Year to you all. We love you all. We appreciate you all. We hope that in the new year, God gives you everything that your church requires and needs to glorify his kingdom even more greatly than you're already doing. And we hope you had a wonderful new year out there, Oasis. We encourage you out there, be a blessing to Oasis the same way you're a blessing to us. Um, go to their website. Go to their Facebook page. 
You'll see the link to both of those in the chat right now. <clears throat> Go check them out. Go support them and what they're doing because they're an extension of us. We say it every week and we mean it. When you support us, you're supporting them and vice versa. They are a vital part of what we do globally. So thank you, Oasis. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all being here. We, of course, also want to extend that same welcome to all of our sister churches and ministries around the world. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching BF uh, TV and listening to BMC Radio and just supporting us throughout these years and allowing God to grow his ministry on a worldwide scale. We thank everyone out there for helping God do what he do in this platform. Because remember, <clears throat> this isn't my car. This isn't my big luxurious car. I just get the privilege of driving it. So we praise God for giving us this ministry, that this vehicle that is this ministry that we then get to navigate um, willingly. Also, um, y'all want to help us do that? Hit that invite button. Help spread the word about our Tuesday night online church services. Tell them, hey, man, it's only an hour. You get in, you get out, you get on with your life. It's only been an hour for four years now. So they're not going to lie and all of a sudden have an hour and a half or two hour service. They pretty much keep it short. If they go over an hour, it's only by a bit. Probably because the word, the Lord had a word that he wanted us to hear. Like tonight, hint, hint, I'm just saying. But hit that button and encourage people to check us out. They can't come out tonight. They can always catch the replay on Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, this very same platform. Make sure you give them the address. Or they can always watch it on YouTube, man. And we got all of our... Uh, messages and TV shows. Everything we've ever done is on our YouTube page. You'll see the link to that in the chat as well right now. Amen. Hey, listen, it's a brand new year. So we ask that you please prepare your hearts and direct your attention to the screen for some brand new announcements. Amen. 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 Listen, as you can see from our announcements, one of our goals moving forward in 2024 is to re-strengthen, not that it needs re-strengthening, but to continue to add strength, I should say, to the brand that is Benevolent Faith Ministries. No, we're not a business or anything like that. But as a ministry, we want to support God's vision of seeing this go global in our support of other churches and ministries and what we are able to do. We're somewhat limited as a smaller ministry in the things that we can do even continuously to this day. But through faith, we believe that God will grow us to be the type of global ministry that truly makes an impact on a global scale. I'm not saying we're not doing that right now. It's just harder for me to quantify it. And in that respect, we just give all glory to God for whatever he's doing. We see the fruits of it and all the people that we hear from in all these different nations. But there is so much more that could be done for the global church body. So that's one of our goals and projections. We're writing on our vision board, people, for what we want to see in 2024, an expansion of the Benevolent Faith Ministries brand so that the whole world knows that we serve a benevolent God who deserves a benevolent faith. Amen. But tonight, y'all, whoo, this message was given to me by the Lord over the last week as we prepare to enter this new year. I mean, it's a day old for crying out loud, if, depending on when you're watching this, a week old or whatever. But as we enter this new year, there is a lot of things going on in people's lives that need to be put into proper focus. And prayerfully, this message will help us do that. So tonight we have two passages of scripture. 
both taken from the book of Acts. The first is from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. And the second is from Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21. I'm going to be reading all of these passages from the New Living Translation version of the Bible. We encourage you to click on the Bible tab and read along in your favorite version of the Bible. Also, click on that notes tab because all the notes for this sermon are available tonight. Amen? <clears throat> and the word of the Lord reads as follows. First, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them in prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Skip down to Acts chapter 11, verses 19 and 21. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only the Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Tonight, my friends, as we prepare our hearts and minds to navigate a brand new year, God willing, I want to speak from the very timely, necessary, and important subject, life interrupted. Life interrupted. Let's look to the Lord, y'all. <clears throat> Father God in heaven, we're just so grateful and thankful for everything that you represent to us, Lord. Everything that you are, everything that you do for us, everything that exists that we can tie back to you, Lord God. We're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for, we're thankful for your mercy. We are thankful, Father God, that you have allowed us to see another year wherein we can celebrate being kingdom residents, where we can celebrate the fact that you have invited us to invite others to become kingdom residents as well. But Lord God, we also know that there are many of us who face some trials and tribulations in the last year that have them going into this new year with a great sense of uncertainty and, and even fear, and doubt. Lord, may this passage tonight Help us to understand how to cope when the trials and tribulations of life come at us such that we don't have to experience a life interrupted. Oh, Lord, who makes all things new, may the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. You and you alone, Lord, are our rock and redeemer. We just ask for the spirit of the living God to fall fresh and new this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let me heart out there say amen. Amen and amen. Whew. Let's just get to it, y'all, because this is a meaty subject and sermon we got tonight. Life interrupted. So as this new year gets underway, there's a lot of people out there that find themselves in a state of transition. Maybe in the year that just ended, you had some life-changing events take place. Maybe you got married. Maybe you got a new job or a promotion at your old job. Maybe you just had a baby added to your family. In all cases, you've experienced some things which put you in an optimistic, celebratory mood as you enter the new year. And I applaud anyone who has been blessed by the grace of God in that regard. But as great as your outlook may be for the new year, and again, trust me, I hope it's an amazing outlook that God has for you. The reality is that there's a lot that can derail your joy and your contentment and your peace in life just like that in an instant. Sometimes life takes sudden, unexpected turns. Sometimes life gets interrupted 
by disruptions or other events which can completely catch you off guard. You got married, like we said before, maybe now you face a divorce or painful separation. You lose that job or you're demoted from that position you got promoted to. Or maybe a loved one passes away suddenly. Friends, these are the times, times of crisis, times of disruption in our lives. When people find themselves in a great struggle to maintain their faith, And so they begin to waver in their faith and in their belief in the Lord and in his promises. Saints of God, there are forces of darkness that are aligned against us that seek to undermine the kingdom of God in our lives. Listen, Satan has been at work in the world for a long time, y'all, and he knows where we're most vulnerable. He knows our weaknesses and where we're suspect. And he's patient. He waits for the perfect time to try to derail your faith. He's looking for the opportune time to catch you off guard and cause disruption in your life. Now, listen, not every disruption comes from Satan. And that's something that believers, we got to start getting past in 2024. Like my brother Greg Kirkland always says, we've been delivered from spookiness. We got to stop believing in things just because we've always believed in them. And one of those things is that Satan is responsible for everything that happens in our lives that's bad. No, sometimes our perspective is skewered and wrong, and it's not necessarily that it's a bad thing, but it's a teachable moment from God. So learn how to discern what is from Satan and what is from God. And better yet, just learn how to persevere in all circumstances so you're not trying to confuse yourself. But anyway, it is impossible to prevent every attack and assault on our lives, my friends. Unfortunately, we're only as strong as our weakest point, And the assaults will typically hit us when our guard is down and when we're totally unprepared for them. You normally get shocked with tragedy or something else when you least expect it, right? See, when difficult times come, it's so critical that in this new year we've just entered, we build ourselves up and strengthen ourselves in the good times so that we're prepared for when the difficult times come. See, when the difficult times come, we're not able to withstand them on our own. We're not able to deal with life's disruptions in our own power. But if we're connected to Christ, he will stand for us and hold us up when we can't stand on our own. Hallelujah. And friends, that is precisely what these people did in our two passages of text this evening. These were a group of people who had their lives interrupted by a sudden unexpected disruption by events transpiring, which completely caught them off guard. But the difference is, during their times of crises and disruption, they never wavered in their faith. In fact, they did just the opposite. They thrived in their faith under those circumstances, a faith that was based in a power higher than themselves. Remember, we said you can't do your own power. They knew that. And so their faith was based in a power higher than themselves. So let me give you all some brief background on where we are in the story, okay? Because you know I'm not just going to drop you off in a text and expect you to know where we are, okay? <clears throat> so the story picks up during the time right after the execution of the Apostle Stephen. So after Stephen's death, Saul of Tarsus, who eventually ended up becoming the Apostle Paul, he gets really emboldened by the effect that Stephen's death has on the people. And as a result, he gets his MPMD on and just a rampage. He goes on a rampage to eradicate every believer possible. 
He literally launches a campaign of terror in order to threaten and intimidate Christians into either giving up their faith entirely or fleeing the region for their own safety. I mean, think about it. The church had been experiencing exponential growth up to that time. And great maturity was happening within the fellowship of the body. People were clamoring to be a part of the way, as it was known back then, before it was known as Christianity. And the life that the way represented, people couldn't wait to be a part of it. So people were happy. The people that had joined the church, remember at Pentecost, it said that 3,000 joined the church that day after Peter preached his sermon. These people were growing and maturing spiritually. And it was a great time in the church. The church grew from 3,000 to 5,000, according to the text of Acts. And its reputation kept growing as well because of all the miracles and things that were happening. There was an overwhelming sense of unity in the church. People were sharing everything and loving on each other. That helped their reputation and helped their reputation spread. So much so that when Ananias and Sapphira, uh, Sapphira, um, Sapphira lied and said, oh yeah, we gave all the money. They were killed instantly because they were going against the fellowship that God had favored so highly that them lying like that stood out like a sore thumb and they were killed instantly for it. That's how much fellowship and unity was there. The apostles were healing people daily. All this stuff is going on right now. The apostles are healing people daily, so much so to where Peter could pass by and people were being healed by his shadow. This is all within the book of Acts, right? And the apostles had boldly defied the Sanhedrin. That's the Jewish council, the Jewish religious council that ran everything. They had been preaching the gospel. They got arrested and went to jail, got brought before the council and was like, the council was like, stop preaching the gospel. They was like, no, we're not going to do that because we're going to listen to the Lord. Went back to jail. The angel of the Lord broke them out of jail. They went right back to the same spot and started preaching the gospel again. And the guards go to the Sanhedrin and is like, uh, didn't we lock them cats up for preaching the gospel? They're out there preaching the gospel again. To where the Sanhedrin couldn't even do nothing about it because they knew that there was a power at work greater than they could imagine. So naturally, the people were strengthened by all these things in the church. It was powerful. Its reputation was powerful and it was growing. But then suddenly, Stephen is executed by stoning. And at this point, Stephen Stephen is one of the leading people in this church. And he gets executed by stoning in a very public way. And that got everybody shook, meaning they were very afraid. Not only that, but the text says that Saul was pleased with Stephen's execution and got emboldened by it. And it incited him to persecute the church even more vigorously. So I was like, a word? Watch this. Y'all think that's something? Hold my beer. Watch this. He's like, you think I was something? I'm really about to go after him now. So after Stephen's execution, Saul decides to go all out against the Christians and against the movement known as the way. And he launches an offensive attack against the church and all its members, arresting and prosecuting and even killing any Christians that he encountered. In fact, when Jesus confronts Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, Saul was on his way to go get permission to persecute more Christians. So as a result of this newly aggressive persecution of the church in Jerusalem, the Christians fled the area. They fled the scene. And according to the text, they were scattered throughout the region. But see, what we need to take note from and the way these folks acted, what we need to take note from how they acted is how this disruption of their lives affected them and how they went about handling the way that life was interrupted for them. 
Because again, oftentimes when our lives get disrupted by things which catch us off guard, our reaction after the initial shock wears off is to panic, right? It's to abandon the things that brought us to that place initially. It's to abandon the mission we were originally on before the disruption caught us off guard. So tonight, y'all, we are going to examine the bravery and the commitment level of these ancient Christians in order to learn from them. Because that's precisely what they showed, bravery and a level of commitment. And in the process, they proved that while we can't control what life throws at us, we can control how we respond to what life throws at us. Essentially, these persecuted Christians from the early church have provided us with a blueprint for how we are supposed to deal with the trials and tribulations that can suddenly disrupt or derail our lives and catch us off guard and leave life interrupted. So here's the first thing we see from this text. And I want y'all to follow along in the notes because I want y'all to take these notes and study them as you go through this year. Refer back to them when you have moments of trepidation and trials and tribulations and you want to know how to handle them. Refer back to this text, okay? And here's the first thing we see from the text. And that's the disruption that they endured. The disruption they endured. I'm right out of the text. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Look at Acts 8, 1. I'll read it again. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. That's Acts 8, chapter 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Here's Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. Listen, I want you to think about what a scattering is, okay? Because we see that word in both of those passages of text, scatter, okay? Think about what a scattering is. It's when a group of living things all suddenly make a break for it, if you will. That is, they all abruptly take off running in different directions, usually, in quite the chaotic way, usually, as a result of something making them break out running, right? In other words, it's a situation where people are trying to get away from something with a great sense of urgency, almost in like a panicking type of way. Am I lying? Think about it. When you turn on the lights, the roaches scatter, right? When the cops show up to the bando party, that's a party at an abandoned building for all of us old heads who are familiar with young people lingo. But when the cops show up to the bando party, all the people there scatter so that they won't be arrested. When fools start shooting up the party or the club, at the first shot, people scatter to get out of the way and to get to safety, right? That's what we see happening in this text. In response to Saul all of a sudden thinking he was Debo, okay, and running roughshod over all the followers of Christ, the people scatter throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, even going as far north as Antioch of Syria and as far west as the island of Cyprus. You see that in the text, and we're going to get to that shortly because that's significant. There was a disruption of their lives, and they were uprooted from their lives. Everything that they had previously known, all the comforts they had previously enjoyed, all those things disappeared in an instant, okay? Because I want you to remember something. Go back to Acts chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It tells us there that lots of these people had come from other places to Jerusalem for Pentecost, okay? In fact, in the text 
lists over a dozen different nations being represented at Pentecost with people coming from as far northwest as Rome and as far southeast as Elam, which as we know it today is modern day Iran. And as far southwest as Cyrene, which is what we know as modern day Libya in northern Africa. Okay, so people from all over the region were coming to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And as we know that many of them that came ended up staying. A lot of that 3,000 and 5,000 was made up of these folks that had come from other places and stayed after Pentecost. Okay, and we see that. We see the proof of that in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, because it describes there how the people were so unified and had, quote, all things in common or were one in heart and mind, if you depending on what version you read. In other words, the people shared everything that they had with each other because so many people had stayed after Pentecost who were actually from distant lands, okay? You see the proof of that in verse 20. It says about how um, followers of the way from Cyrene and Cyprus were ones that went to Antioch to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, okay? How could someone from Cyrene, Northern Africa, go to Antioch to preach the gospel unless they had been at Pentecost to learn about the gospel and become part of the church initially? See, we have to think our way through these things. So without permanent homes and permanent jobs in Jerusalem and Judea, all the people who stayed in Jerusalem to learn more about being followers of Jesus, they needed that type of support from the Christian community. They were displaced from their home. Now, they stayed by choice, but because they stayed, they needed the church to be benevolent and for people to give what and share what they had and invite them over for meals. They needed that. Because they were legitimately starting their lives over from where they had come from. I'm sure that when they left where they came from, all those nations that it lists in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, I'm sure that when they left all those places and came to Jerusalem, they probably didn't plan on staying in Jerusalem. Maybe they did, but it was all because of what happened at Pentecost that they ended up staying and wanted to embrace the way. So a lot of them, they didn't have, they didn't come with a lot. They only had what they came with, traveling, right? Imagine you travel to Miami for the weekend and you end up getting stuck there. You end up staying there by choice for two or three years or for however long time it is, right? You're going to need some type of income to, or some type of help for you to cope in Miami because that's not where you're from, right? Same premise here. So the, for them to leave, so abruptly, in Jerusalem, they're leaving with nothing now, right? They already had to share everything in Jerusalem. I just described that. They're from someplace else. In Jerusalem, they already living off of the love of the people and having to share with the people. Now they're being made to scatter. I mean, think about it. If something made you and your family leave the house that you live in right now, come on, we got to go now immediately. You're not going to be able to take everything. You're only going to take what's most essential and hope that wherever you're going, you can start over or acquire the things that you left behind, right? And again, they let, they stayed behind or they left, stayed behind in Jerusalem by choice. It was the right choice and it was for a good purpose. But because they stayed behind, they didn't have a lot. They had to depend on the love of each other. So when you flee and you already didn't have nothing, now you're really fleeing with nothing. Friend, the majority of time when someone has to flee for their life, they don't got the requisite time to stop and meticulously pack up all their belongings and all that stuff. No, they got to go right away. And these people were made to leave prematurely. They weren't ready to leave. They had to up and leave. They were made to leave prematurely. So they probably didn't get to pack anything except for what they had clothes-wise, right? A couple personal items. 
And they certainly would have struggled to take like donkeys and stuff with them. Like think about what fleeing as a refugee means, right? You got to go. A donkey's going to slow you down. So, I mean, maybe they would have taken it. But again, when you went to Jerusalem for wherever you were from, maybe you did have a donkey, but maybe you had to sell that donkey in order to have money to maintain where you live. I'm not sure, but they probably didn't have a lot when they fled. That's the point. And ain't that oftentimes true in our own lives? Isn't it? Sometimes we don't take the requisite time to stop and calculate our next step when crises hit, when disruptions come our way. Instead, we flee emotionally. We scatter mentally. And we end up in places that we don't want to be. Much like with these ancient Christians, disruptions in our lives can destroy every sense of normalcy that people become accustomed to. Think about it. When you're used to doing the same thing the same way all the time and you become comfortable in it, you're not really looking for change. So when change happens suddenly, it can be jarring and something you're not ready for if you don't deal with it the right way. Saints of God, many of you watching this right now may have experienced a similar type of disruption in your own lives in the past year. Maybe somebody close to you died. Maybe you got sick and it thoroughly challenged you in your faith. Maybe your financial situation changed for the worse. I'm not sure what you were going through, but God knows what you're going through. And what those ancient Christians, what got them through that difficult time was their unwavering faith. Despite their circumstances, their maintenance of their faith is what helped them persevere through their difficulties. That's scriptural. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, we are always confident, although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You know what that's saying, friends. You know it's coming. Say it with me. Paul is telling the people of God in Christ that they persevere because they use their faith eyes and not their faces eyes. That's right. That's the first instance of that reference to that in 2024. Sometimes it's hard for us to realize that God is still working in us because we as humans have what we believe or we base, excuse me, we base what we believe on what we see and not what we can't see, which is essentially what faith is. Hebrews 11, chapter one, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. That's what faith is. It means you believe in something that's not there based on who made the promise about that something, which is God, who is a man who he cannot lie, who is the Lord God who changes not, who has all power and authority in the universe. So when he says it, why are you not believing it? That's what faith is. That's what walking in faith means. Saints of God, by utilizing your faith eyes, you will be able to prevent the disruptions of life from derailing you. Because when you live and walk in faith, things may catch you off guard, but they will not defeat you. They will not destroy you. And right now, somebody's like, oh, Rev. Rod, that sounds good, but you don't know my struggle, homie. Okay? It's real out here. All right. How do I even remotely go about having that type of faith? First, you got to actually believe. You got to actually believe in this stuff. That's the first and the first and most critical step, because none of this works without that. OK, secondly, as you believe, remember who you're believing in and the power that they wield over all things. OK, when you do those two things, it'll make the third step seem more realistic and easier. And that's to be strong in your faith. 
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. By Paul saying, stand firm in the faith, he's telling the church in Corinth, and by extension us today, to remain strong and courageous in the face of opposition, not just from the culture around us, but also in the face of opposition from the trials and tribulations that life throws at you. And that's exactly what we see happening with these believers being scattered from Jerusalem. Because as we're going to see in a minute, and despite this disruption of their lives, they maintained their faith and walked in strength in accordance with that faith. Friends, as believers, as followers of, of, of God, as followers of his son, I should say, God has called us and chosen us for a heavenly purpose. But in order for us to be effective in this work, we need to overcome any trials and tribulations in this life, which we do through faith, through trusting in God while we're in those circumstances. Amen? So, We've seen the disruption that they've endured, that they endured. Next, let's examine the uncertainty that they faced. The uncertainty that they faced, because that's what disruptions in life often lead to, right? They lead to confusion and uncertainty. And that was certainly the case here in the text. Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 3. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Here you got a group of people. Think about this now. Here you got a group of people who had been in perfect fellowship with each other and with other believers who knew where their next meal that was going to come from, where they were going to be laying their head, who knew where the love for them was sourced, okay? And the next thing you know, they're being scattered because of persecution. They're running scared after Stephen got killed because now Saul is running around from house to house, as the text tells us, dragging people off to jail. So they were afraid they might be next. And basically, they were completely uprooted from the lives that they had established in Jerusalem, even for that brief amount of time. And yet, despite all that uncertainty, they knew well enough to continue to preach the gospel. Despite what they faced, they kept their faith and walked in it by continuing to spread the good news of Christ, by continuing to champion the kingdom of God. In other words, don't miss this. They did not abandon the original mission, despite how their circumstances changed. The uncertainty of their future had no bearing on the certainty of their faith. Ooh, let me run that back. The uncertainty of their future had no bearing on the certainty of their faith. Everybody say certainty or type it in the chat. No, our faith is founded on the certainty of who Christ is and the power that he therefore holds. As a believer, you should have certainty in your faith because your faith is grounded, grounded in what you know to be true about God. So you don't worry about what you think might happen or what could happen because you don't put faith in the potential for those outcomes, right? Your faith or certainty is founded on the power of God and his ability to see you through any circumstances. See, much of that certainty in our faith, it comes from the encouragement that we get from the word of God. Because even though Paul knows that these disruptions in life can make it difficult to trust God in times of extreme uncertainty, he reminds us that ultimately 
God will work all things out for the benefit of anybody that claims that they love him. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And that's exactly the type of certainty of faith in Christ and the power that he holds that these ancient Christians had even as they were being scattered and persecuted and fleeing for their lives. Mm -mm -mm. They had been in fellowship with others. They had been in right standing in God, uh, in Christ with others. So they used that experience to propel them through the difficult periods instead of allowing the uncertainty of those difficult periods to overwhelm and overtake them. We should be doing the exact same thing. When we're in right standing with God, we can enjoy his promises of protection and healing and restoration that come with being in right standing with them. Those realities should help us navigate those uncertain times in our lives. Saints of God, having faith in times of uncertainty can allow you to find peace in God's presence. But by the same token, conversely, being unfaithful during times of uncertainty can harden our hearts with pride and cause us to grow distant in our relationships with the Lord. Faith in God during uncertain times allows him to lift those heavy burdens off of you. That's why God gave us the gift of faith, so that we can use it to recognize his works and not be in constant worry when we're surrounded by uncertainties. Many bad things could have happened to these Christians, y'all, as they were being scattered. A lot of bad could have happened to them. They're traveling with no protection. They're traveling with minimal things, minimal food. A lot of stuff could have happened to them out there as they're traveling. But they were determined not to let that affect them. And they remained committed to the mission of Christ. So how about you? How committed are you to seeing God's will carried out in your life, even when you're being emotionally and spiritually disrupted and scattered and facing uncertainty? It's a question we got to ask ourselves in this new year, if we're going to be real with ourselves, because that's where we get the inspirational part of all this. Now, now we get to the good part, okay? Because we've talked about the disruption they endured and the certainty that they faced. Now comes the good part. Finally, I'm done, y'all. Let's examine the strength that they went in. Whew, the strength that they went in. Again, I'm right out of the text. Look at Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only the Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Y'all like, okay, well, what's so amazing about that? Well, in order for you to grasp the amazingness of that passage of text, you need to know the geography of the ancient world during that time. See, Antioch, where they ended up traveling to, was about 300 miles north up the coast, north of Jerusalem. Oh, and Phoenicia, which is also mentioned in that text, was along the way to Antioch, also up the coast in an area that's now known as Lebanon. So these people, traveled 300 miles up the coast from where they had been scattered. And if that don't sound like a lot to you, consider the fact that they weren't in them car, wasn't no spirit airlines, 
Were no bicycles for them to jump on? Again, we just mentioned they probably didn't even take their camels. I mean, excuse me, their donkeys with them, okay? They had to walk that 300 miles. That's like walking from Malibu outside of Los Angeles all the way to San Francisco, okay? That's a long way. In fact, if you average 20 miles a day and various factors would determine that rate of progress, it would take you about 15 days or two weeks in a day of actual walking to get there. You know, people, again, they usually prefer donkeys, but donkeys probably weren't available. So it takes you like two weeks to make this travel. And the text also said that they went to Cyprus. Cyprus was about 250 miles to the northwest of Jerusalem. And you could only get there by boat. Why? Because it was an island surrounded by water in the Mediterranean Sea. You could only get there by boat. So that was 250 miles to the northwest. So despite having their lives disrupted and facing this uncertain future, these folks responded by continuing to take the gospel to all these different places, over 550 total miles, 300 miles to the north of the, on the coast, 250 miles to the northwest on the Mediterranean Sea. So by boat, uh, by boat and by foot, these people took the gospel from the place where that disruption and uncertainty was born. Don't miss that. In other words, they didn't let their circumstances change their dedication to the mission. And instead, they faced those circumstances in the power of their faith. So from where the place where they got scattered, instead of running like chickens with their head cut off and just running and hiding, they dispersed from that place and went to other places, spreading the gospel along the way. Yeah, they had been displaced. Yeah, they faced an uncertain future. That didn't stop them from spreading the gospel. That didn't stop them from converting people to Christ. They stuck to the mission. It took bravery. It took courage. It took commitment for them to do that. This is what we need to be learning from them, y'all. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 21. The power of the Lord was with them. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. They faced all these circumstances in the power of their faith. Despite the circumstances, despite being disrupted and scattered, they continued to do the work that glorified God. But they were only able to do that work in God's power. You see that from verse 21. And as a result, God's power not only sustained them, but it made their witness effective to the Gentiles in these cities that they went to, who, quote, believed and turned to the Lord, as it says at the end of chapter 21. Friends, God will carry you through those disrupted, uncertain times based on your faith and your dedication to him. But he does so in his strength. See, so many of us aren't winning. We aren't seeing our prayers met because we're trying to go forward in our own strength. You're trying to do it in your own strength. No, I can do it. I can handle this. I got this. No, you don't. Only a supernatural strength can overcome the supernatural powers at work in this world, y'all. You don't believe me? Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You see that? That's a fight you can't handle on your own. How are you going to beat an unseen enemy? You can't. You need the unseen, invisible, but all-seeing God to fight for you. Let God fight those battles in his strength. Give it up to him so that you can have peace. But when you look at this text, you notice what else these people didn't do, these ancient Christians that were scattered from where they were, had their lives disrupted and faced all this uncertainty? They didn't move forward sulking or pouting about their circumstances either. 
They didn't make it about themselves and their own suffering. Oh, Lord, why did you scatter us from where we were? Why did you uproot us from the lives, the newly established lives we had made in Jerusalem? Instead, they continued to do God's work and expanded the breadth of the impact of God's work by taking it to areas and regions where it was previously unknown and setting it upon new heights. Saints of God, the truth is, the truth is that oftentimes we tend to pout and sulk when we don't get our own way with God. Whenever we don't understand what God is doing because we don't like what he's doing, right? You know how your kids get in their feelings when they don't like a decision that you make? We do that with God a lot, don't we? And when we do it, we forget that our feelings shouldn't be based on our circumstances, but our obedience to the word of God. These people didn't do that. Instead of being in their feelings about having their lives disrupted and being scattered, they became empowered from it and used it to spread the gospel even further. You want to experience the strength and power of God in your life in 2024? Then stop trying to do things in your own power and start letting God do them in his. That's the lesson that we can take from these folks. That's the model they gave us to follow. Their faithfulness to God trumped their own feelings and desires. Their dedication to Christ and to spreading the gospel superseded anything that they may have felt as a result of the disruptions and uncertainties that they faced in life. Here's the other amazing thing about the strength that they went in. Think about where they were going because it was not an ideal place for them. Antioch was a wicked city. It was probably second only to Corinth in the ancient world for having a bad reputation as a place where anything goes and even with greed and pride and all the other sins of the flesh are freely engaged in and encouraged. It was the city that encouraged the worship of multiple gods. So it was all type of chicanery going on in Antioch. In other words, it was the perfect place where the one true God in Christ should be exalted and where the type of life that these people knew should have been interrupted by the truth of the gospel. Amen. So listen, as we close tonight, my friends, I have to say this. I would be remiss as a teacher and as a preacher, as an expositor of the word of God, as an exeg uh, exegete, someone who exegetes the word of God. I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that I purposefully shifted the focus, the theological focus of these passages of text away from what teachers and preachers usually highlight from these passages, which is that Stephen's death and the subsequent scattering of the Christians in the church in Jerusalem actually served as the catalyst for the Jews to take the gospel to the Gentiles in areas outside of Jerusalem. That's the original and that's the usual theological context within which people preach about the verses that we just covered, okay? In other words, their focal point is that God's plan of redemption of all mankind through Christ will not be circumvented by human efforts. It's about how Saul could have persecuted all the Christians possible. Still wouldn't stop God's ultimate plan for humanity. And that's true. God will advance his plan and carry out his own will in the world, even despite circumstances created by evil men. And that's true even to this day. So when you see the news about all these governments doing this, that, and the third, evil organizations doing this, that, and the third, take heart. God's plan will come to fruition no matter what the news says, no matter what it looks like. Think about it in this instance, in our text. The men who were persecuting God's church, they were serving Satan. But God used the persecution as a catalyst to spread the gospel to new regions, okay? God's plan will always come to fruition. 
Nothing can stop what God ordains because what he ordains, he will maintain and sustain. All right, remember that in 2024. But that's not the focus. That's not the theological context within which we placed focus on these verses tonight. That's a great message and a great application to take away from these verses, no question. But we wanted to look at these verses a bit differently in light of this new dawning year. Because again, a lot of people are coming out of something in 2023 and they're looking for hope in 2024. They were thrown a curve. Life threw them a curve last year and it disrupted their lives and it led to them having uncertainty heading into 2024. The same way that the scattering of the church in Jerusalem disrupted their lives and caused them to have uncertainty about where they were going. But friends, I've come to tell you today, when life throws you a curve, just respond the way these people did. They stuck to the original mission, sharing the gospel. They committed to that original mission despite their circumstances. And through it all, they never wavered in their faith and trust in God. We need to take our cues from these brave folks, y'all, and do the same thing in our own lives. We need to move forward in this new year with boldness in Christ and not in our own strength in his. So that the next time you experience a sudden disruption and catches you off guard, it won't leave life interrupted. Amen. But listen, you heard what I just said. You can't do it in your own power. You need the power of God in Christ Jesus in order for you to overcome any disruptions that pop up in life. And that means that you have to first accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And here's your chance to do that. Is there one? Won't you come? What better way to start the new year off than accepting Christ in your, as your Lord and Savior and starting anew, starting fresh, so that whenever life gets interrupted, you know where to turn for your help. It's not going to be in the world. It's not going to be in self-help books. It's not going to be in people like Dr. Phil. It's not going to be in a lot of these charlatan churches out here. It's only going to be found in the word of God and the promises of God that you receive and are granted through your adoption into the family, through your faith in Christ Jesus. Is there one? Start your year off right by making Christ your Lord and Savior right now. Won't you come? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are always so thrilled at this time, not because of anything that we've done, but because the Lord is speaking to your heart. Whatever the message was that got through to you, that's what's going to compel you to go further in your faith. You don't even have to join our church. I mean, we appreciate it if you do, but find a Bible-based church. If you need help doing that, email us. We'll help you do that. Info at benevolentfaithministries.org. We'll help you find a Bible-based church where you can start growing in the Lord. Don't let the disruptions of life cause you to have uncertainty. Be certain in your faith so that you don't live. A life interrupt. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about my future. Why? It's gonna be big. I'm running into destiny, shouting into my promise. Why?